Thank you for joining us for this webinar, where we will present you with the Bristow's competition team's top tips for ensuring competitional compliance. I'm Osman Zafar and I'm joined by Sophie Lawrence. We're both senior associates here in the competition team at Bristow's. Before we launch into our top tips, I'll begin by reminding you of a few EU competitional basics. I'll then hand to Sophie to begin our top tips, and we'll end by leaving you with some concluding thoughts. Whenever you're thinking about competitional, it's always useful to take a moment to think about what competitional seeks to achieve. Competitional broadly seeks to promote and maintain competition, and it does that by regulating anti-competitive or potentially anti-competitive conduct. Unique to EU competition law is also the single market imperative. EU competition rules are designed to promote the integration of the internal market within the EU. EU competition law does this through two main legal provisions, Articles 101 and 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Article 101 is fundamentally about multilateral conduct, that's to say, the interactions between independent players. It prohibits agreements or practices which have the object or effect of preventing, restricting or distorting competition within the EU. Article 102 is fundamentally about unilateral conduct. That is, under what circumstances the conduct of a company with significant market power, acting alone, may harm competition. It prohibits abuses of a dominant position. We have separate webinars available which discuss these provisions in further detail, but it is also worth noting that each EU member state also has national equivalents to Articles 101 and 102, which broadly follow similar principles. In the UK, these are Chapters 1 and 2 of the Competition Act 1998. And finally, before we move on to our top tips, it's worth remembering why we might want to ensure competitional compliance. First of all, you will want to make sure that your agreements are compliant with competitional principles to guarantee that they are enforceable. The public enforcement of competitional certainly gets the most press. If you are investigated by a competition authority, the European Commission in the EU, or the EFT in the UK, there may be significant reputational damage. There are, of course, the costs involved of becoming embroiled in a prolonged competitional investigation, perhaps even kicked off by an intrusive and disruptive dorm raid. Ultimately, an authority investigation may conclude with the imposition of significant fines. For individuals, certain member states have also introduced the possibility of personal sanctions. In the UK, for example, there are criminal sanctions including the possibility of imprisonment, and directors may also be disqualified. All of these are reasons why, in terms of competition or compliance, prevention is certainly better than cure, which is why competition or compliance is key. So the competition lawyers here at Bristow have put their heads together, and we've come up with our top 10 tips for competition or compliance. I'll now hand over to Sophie for tip number one. So tip number one is that the culture of competition compliance comes from above. And probably the most important message to take away from this webinar is that senior directors and CEOs of companies need to take personal ownership for their corporate competition compliance. And this means paying more than lip service. Senior staff need to engage with the issues, attending training sessions, uh, bringing the issues forward in their day-to-day interactions with other members of the company as required. And this is strongly in their own interests. As we've heard from Osman, a number of jurisdictions, including the UK, treat competition or infringement as potentially criminal. Even if no criminal proceedings are involved, a serious breach of the competition rules can cost companies millions of dollars or pounds in fines, not to mention the likelihood that third parties, such as customers who've been affected by any breach of the competition rules, can claim for damages. Directors and senior, sta senior staff, therefore, must take ownership of their own and their company's competition compliance. And to do that, they should make sure that it, it's not just a matter of complying with the black letter law that Osman has um, given an outline of, 
Of course, that's important, but perhaps more important is observing a spirit of fair competition throughout the company. That's more likely to help your company to avoid competition or serious competition or infringement. So, for example, think about the way staff are incentivized. A culture which is purely driven by profit maximization can sometimes lead to an environment where anti-competitive anti conduct can flourish. Number two, determine your appetite for risk. Competition and compliance is fundamentally a question of risk. First, there is the risk that any relevant conduct will be held to infringe the substantive competition rules. This is often something which is difficult to determine for sure, given that much can depend on complex legal and complex economic analyses. Second, as noted in the introduction, there is the procedural risk that you'll get embroiled in an authority investigation, either initiated by the authority or following a complaint by a disgruntled third party. Our advice is that you take the time to identify the substantive and procedural competitional risks that are common in your sector as this will guide you on where to focus your compliance efforts. Furthermore, you may want to think about what your corporate attitude to commercial and legal risk is. This will affect how you approach conditional compliance. You may be happy to include some provisions in an agreement, which may ultimately be unenforceable, or you may think that such provisions are not worth the paper they are printed on. You may be prepared to risk an adverse finding by an authority for something that is commercially vital for your business, especially if you think that on the basis of established law, you would have excellent chances on appeal. At the other end of the spectrum, you may want to avoid any adverse press whatsoever, let alone the management time and financial costs associated with an investigation and, of course, possible fine. So these are all factors that you should bear in mind before you think about designing your competition or compliance program. Tip number three, tailored competition compliance programs are the most effective. So what should your competition law compliance program look like? How should a company go about making its competition um, compliance culture into an effective program? There's no one right answer. Different types of program are going to work well or less well for different companies. But a typical competition compliance program will consist of a mixture of written materials and then focused industry-specific training. An off-the-shelf off the package is not going to highlight the risk flashpoints in your industry as effectively as tailored training. Practical training, such as case studies and workshops, are often the most effective at bringing the issues to the forefront of employees' minds. Most companies will also need to think about arranging different types of training or differently focused training for different groups. So, for example, sales personnel need a, a slightly different set of um, workshops from senior managers. And don't rest on your laurels. A competition law compliant culture needs to be kept in focus through, over, over time through regular messaging by senior management and potentially also refresher training. Um, one thing that can work well is having an online test that has to be filled in by all employees who deal with customers or competitors every couple of years or so. Tip number four, a compliant program without teeth is just a lot of noise. So creating a compliance program is, of course, an excellent first step. It sets out and trains people on what is expected of them. However, it's worth noting that as it stands, competition authorities don't even consider the existence of a competition or compliance program to be a mitigating factor should there be an infringement. That is why an effective compliance program needs to be backed up appropriately. You need to identify the risks that you want certain personnel to look out for and set out appropriate incentives for them to tackle them in the way that you'd like them to do so. But of course, any internal sanctions need to be appropriate and proportionate. They also need to be accompanied by appropriate incentives to report any competitional risks identified. It is therefore important to have an internal reporting mechanism for competitional risk to in-house counsel. If you suspect serious infringement of competition law, you may want to introduce grace periods in which conduct can be reported without consequences for the individuals. Remember to have a mixture of carrots and sticks to ensure competition law compliance. Tip number five, ensure that your company is behaving independently in the market. 
Many of the most serious competition law infringements can be avoided by asking the simple question, has my company decided on its commercial strategy by itself independently, or has it discussed or agreed it with another company? Now, of course, commercial agreements remain important and viable and are the lifeblood of your company, but other sorts of agreements where conduct is aligned, often on, in more informal agreements, can be um, problematic and lead to competition or infringement. The classic examples of competition or infringements, so we're talking here about breach of Article 101 of the EU, EU Treaty, um, <clears throat> so the prohibition on anti-competitive agreements. Um, classic examples of cartel agreements, the most serious infringements, are price fixing, so that's agreeing minimum or fixed prices, um, sometimes or often coupled with output restrictions. So the obvious aim of an agreement of that kind, where entered into between competitors, is very much to increase income to the competitors at the expense of consumers. Um, market sharing agreements are similarly problematic, so that would be dividing up particular territories or customer groups between competitors. And there's also scope for cartel activity around in procurement markets or auction-driven markets. So um, anything where a bid bidding um, situation is not handled fairly. So we come agreements between companies to um, as to how much they're going to bid, bid rotation. Those are regarded as very serious breaches of competition rules, and those are the sorts of key areas that your staff need to be aware of so that they can avoid them. This, this, these situations are where a line in the sand has to be drawn because any, any conduct of this kind is going to be um, clamped down upon very seriously by the competition authorities. Tip number six, take care of the meetings of industry bodies or trade associations. Trade and industry associations can bring many benefits to the sectors that they serve. However, in bringing together many independent market participants, there can also be an arena in which behaviour giving rise to competitional risks takes place. If you are an industry body, make sure that you have appropriate safeguards in place. Have a competitional compliance programme or manual and make sure that your members are made aware of what discussions can and cannot take place in meetings. Ensure that the topics for discussion at your meetings are agreed in advance in an agenda and of course that these are legitimate topics which do not stray into commercially sensitive issues such as pricing. Stick to communication on technical and general industry issues. Ensure that the meetings are minuted to provide contemporaneous evidence of what was, and importantly, what was not discussed on the day. If you are participating in a trade association meeting, remember that you are ultimately responsible for your own company's competitional compliance. Make sure that you do not disclose or receive any commercially sensitive information. And remember that competitional risk is not just related to the discussions that take place in official meetings. Sensitive discussions should not be taking place on the fringes of association meetings, in particular in the bar afterwards when judgment may be impaired. Tip number seven, make sure your agreements are enforceable. So we've been mentioning some of the headline grabbing issues the potential for high fines or even for criminal sanctions. But a very important practical consequence of including anti-competitive terms in commercial agreements is that the agreement as a whole may be potentially unenforceable. And now that's the last thing anyone wants when an agreement has been negotiated, often at length, and where potentially significant amounts of run money are riding on the contract. Examples of contractual provisions which competition law may render unenforceable, depending on the circumstances, include minimum pricing agreements, prohibitions on selling outside a particular territory, non-compete agreements, some exclusive dealing agreements, and the exchange of commercially sensitive information. This last is an area to be particularly aware of. Exchanging, agreeing to exchange commercially sensitive information, particularly on a regular basis over time, and particularly where future or current prices or, or commercial strategies are divulged is particularly risky. Tip number eight, be aware of your special responsibilities. Companies with significant market power 
those which could be dominant for the purposes of competition law, will be subject to a special responsibility not to impair the process of competition. This means that conduct which otherwise would be perfectly legal from a competition law perspective for a non-dominant company may well give rise to competition law risk if you are considered to be dominant. A dominant company is broadly one which is considered to be able to behave independently of its competitors, suppliers and customers. Often market share is taken as a proxy or first indicator of dominance. So if you suspect that you may have a market share of more than 40% in a relevant economic market, you may want to consider what extra precautions you should take to minimise competition or risk. Certainly you should do so if you may have a share in excess of 50%. So take the time to understand your company's market position in relation to the markets in which it is active. Potential abuses could include refusals to supply, in particular if you previously supplied a customer but now want to stop, perhaps because you're about to enter the market downstream yourself. Tying the purchase of one product to another distinct product may also be problematic, as it may force customers to buy products which they don't actually need. There are also a number of pricing practices which may give rise to concern, including predatory pricing, that is selling at a loss in order to drive out competition, knowing full well that once competition has been eliminated, you may be able to raise prices. Even excessive uh, prices may give rise to concern, by which I mean prices which do not correspond at all to the economic value of the product in question. Even the way in which you structure your rebates may require more careful scrutiny in a position of dominance. It is worth noting that certain sectors give rise to a greater number of Article 102 issues. A sector under particular scrutiny at the moment is the pharmaceutical sector. Others which have received uh, significant attention are, are those which have been recently liberalised, where there may be former incumbents with significant market power. Tip number nine, take care over your internal communications with in-house counsel. In-house counsel has an important role to play. He or she is someone who understands the business inside out and can give practical advice about the real competitional risks. However, do bear in mind that if the European Commission comes knocking, communications between the business and in-house counsel will be disposable. They do not benefit from privilege for these purposes. And indeed, this will be something that the authority will be very much looking for because they often find such communications to be a useful source of factual and strategic information about what the company has been looking to achieve. I mean, this, it, it may not be wholly practical in all cir circumstances, but it would sometimes be worth talking things over orally with in-house counsel before committing detailed discussion of particular issues to writing. That can enable in-house counsel to give a view um, as to the legality of the proposed strategy without putting something down in writing which could be a hostage to fortune in the future, in particular if it's not something that is really then pursued by the company. And it's also worth noting that if the competition authorities do find evidence that in-house counsel has advised the business people not to engage in a particular course of conduct, um, but they then do so and a competition infringement is found, then that sort of evidence could be um, a reason for the competition authority to actually impose higher fines than they would have done otherwise. Tip number 10, watch your language. Remember to be careful about your language, both what you do put in writing and what you don't. Only write down text that you would be happy for a competition authority or a court to read. Remember that it's often difficult to work out the intention behind emails, and if competitional issues later arise, the worst will almost always be assumed. For example, even the most harmless of communication with a competitor mentioning pricing risks being interpreted as evidence of a serious competition or infringement. It's easy for businesses to get carried away, exaggerating their own market position and perhaps belittling the position of others. But remember, language conveying that you have market power or are dominant and that you can or would like to be able to behave independently of other market players will be interpreted against you if issues later arise. As well as taking care of what you don't put in writing, 
Remember that sometimes it will be in your interest to keep a contemporaneous written record, as this is the type of evidence that competition authorities attribute the most weight to. So do try and keep a simple record which evidences what was and what was not discussed in meetings with competitors. If you are going to take some action which has some competitional risk, but which has been carefully considered with the conclusion that no serious risks should arise, then do keep a record of your objective reasons for deciding to do it. So those were our top 10 tips. But what if the worst happens and you suspect an infringement has taken place in your company? If the issue has arisen through contacts with other companies, get a factual account down in writing. Indeed, it is best practice to keep written accounts of meetings with competitors at all times. If you are at a meeting where you find that collusion may be happening, leave the meeting and get your departure noted. It may well be time to get your in-house or external counsel involved. In the worst case, a leniency application may be needed to be made as a matter of urgency, divulging what's happened to the competition authorities and asking for lenient treatment. We hope that you found this webinar useful. Um, if you would like any further information, then please do get in touch.